So, uh, welcome. I'm so pleased to be back here to continue my lecture series about famous women in history. My name is Richard Brabander. Uh, I am originally from New York, just a little bit of a bio. Uh, I moved up here about 20 years ago to go to Brandeis, where I got my PhD. And since 2008, I have been uh, down at Bridgewater, uh, teaching at Bridgewater State University. And uh, so, so far we've had uh, Cleopatra and we had um, Empress Wu. Uh, last time, so now we're moving forward in time to the early modern period, and this is a period I am pretty familiar with, given that my dissertation was on 17th century England, although in a way that is kind of a bias, because I'm so much of a restoration person that the Elizabeth Elizabethan era is um, kind of an interesting topic. One of the reasons why I ended up a restoration specialist is because of the uh, paleography involved in transcribing documents from this period. Uh, but it is a really interesting period, and so um, I have a whole host of uh, things to say about Elizabeth and her time. Uh, and so, and as always, um, if I'm talking too fast or we have questions, uh, we can either do them as on the fly or have a QA session at the, at the end, either way that works for, for you folks. So typically what I do is give a little overview of the history of the country or the region where the ruler, the woman ruler is um, uh, situated in and then talk about her life. But in addition, we'll also talk about how Queen Elizabeth has been portrayed in both film uh, and some recent biographies as well to give you ideas if you're more interested to learn more about her. And I have to say, of course, what a timely uh, time to have this discussion about English history given that we just went through uh, an election this week uh, in which the Conservative Party won a resounding victory, which probably means that Brexit will happen. And so uh, in, odd, in an odd way, Brexit is the, uh, the end process of something that starts actually with the Tudors, which is the unification of the British Isles, and now it seems like we're going in the completely opposite direction. <laughs> so uh, again, a lot of things to talk about here, and so with that, uh, why don't we just get started. So as you can see, she lived from 1533 to 1603, and she ruled as Queen Regnant, and we'll talk about why that's an important term to remember, from 1558 to 1603, so one of the longest reigns in British history. So um, we need to talk a little bit about the Tudor dynasty and the Tudors themselves and how they came to power and the situation in England uh, before Elizabeth is born. And of course her father is larger than life both uh, figuratively and literally as you can see uh, in that painting of Henry VIII. And Henry VIII comes to power as a result of a long drawn out civil war and conflict between two rival factions uh, in 15th century England that were vying for the, the throne, the Lancasters and the Yorks, which if, by the way, if you're a fan of Game of Thrones, is why um, George R. R. Martin, who's a big history nerd, named the two rival families Lannister and Stark instead of Lancaster and York. And these two families fought it out for almost 30 years, and in the end the Tudors win out, and so they become the next uh, ruling dynasty, and they will uh, ruled England from 1485 to 1603, and Elizabeth is the last of the Tudors. So the most famous of all, besides Elizabeth herself, the most famous of these rulers is, of course, her father, King Henry VIII, who ruled from 1509 to 1547. And many, many things are happening during his reign, uh, but most importantly because of how it really shapes a lot of the contours of her eventual reign, is the religious uh, changes that were happening in Europe during this period, which of course uh, we now call the Reformation. So I'm not going to go into too much theological detail here, as I'm a historian, not a uh, religious historian uh, or theologian, but we do need to talk about some of the basic difference between Catholics and Protestants and how that plays into the situation in England uh, as Henry and later Elizabeth are ruling. So Protestantism, really quickly, the really quick version is, it is um, develops from the ideas and thoughts of Martin Luther, who in 1517 famously posted his theses on the door of the chapel uh, church in Wittenberg, Germany. And from there, it spreads pretty rapidly across Northern Europe. And England was involved very early on in this process of being receptive to the Reformation movement. As early as 1526, you have a Bible that is printed. This, in fact, this is the first Bible ever printed in England, uh, in English, in 1526, the Tyndale Bible and it was a precursor to the King James edition. 
and it really laid uh, some of the basic principles about Protestantism that will take hold in England over time, although it's a very long drawn out conflict for the success of this Reformation. So basically some of the basic differences between Protestantism and Catholicism, if you're not aware, is priesthood for all believers in Protestantism, uh, that you read the Bible in your own language, not Latin, that there's clerical marriage, uh, refusal of the authority of the papacy or the pope, and faith over good works. Those are some of the basic big feature differences between Protestants and Catholics and how that plays out in the history of early modern England. Now, King Henry VIII himself was a very pious, devout Catholic initially in his early life, but as he got older and was exposed to some of these Reformation thoughts, he became interested in it, although he remained relatively conservative in his um, acceptance of the Reformation. But of course, if you know anything about Henry VIII, you know about the story of his six wives and how, uh, in some ways, the Reformation got a boost because of his dispute involving his first marriage. Now, in retrospect, I would say that that's a little bit overdrawn, right? That this idea that the only reason why the Church of England is created is because Henry wanted to annul his marriage to Catherine of Aragon, and when the Church didn't agree with that, uh, he decided to pull England out of the, the Catholic Church. There's a little bit more to it than that, uh, although since we're not having a lecture about Henry VIII, I'm not going to go too much into detail here, but there were certainly political and economic reasons why it was very beneficial for Henry to seize control of the church in England and have control over all the resources, the bureaucracy, uh, and the, the wealth of the church and have it in his hands. And so this dispute about getting his first marriage to Catherine of Aragon annulled uh, was a nice way to give um, cover for his goals to really assert more control over uh, the practice of religion in England. So when he is unable to get that uh, annulment of his marriage, and the reason why he's annulling the marriage is because she's not having any children. So one thing Henry was very much aware of was the need to produce a male heir. Since that had been part of the dispute why there had been the War of the Roses in the first place, uh, he wanted to secure his succession in his line. And so when his wives weren't able to do so, um, he would um, uh, seek out another woman. Uh, and in this case, he does seek out uh, Anne Boleyn. But anyway, in 1534, with the Act of Supremacy, uh, the Church of England is created. It's a separate organization. It breaks with Rome, and much of the church property in England is seized by Henry uh, and the state. The monasteries are dissolved, and he begins the slow process of enacting Protestant reforms, but very slowly. And this uh, Act of Supremacy also involved uh, greater, stricter control over Wales, and so 1535, Wales is annexed to England and then a consolidation of England's holdings in Ireland. So again, this process of creating the United Kingdom, of bringing the disparate entities of the uh, British Isles together under one regime begins with the Tudors, and maybe today historians, or maybe uh, centuries from now historians, will look at this time period we're living in right now as when the UK breaks apart. We'll see. So um, with uh, his, uh, his health goes into decline, he had an, a jousting accident, and he became very morbidly obese as a result of it, suffered from gout. You can see his relative size there. And uh, he had a host of other marriages. Again, uh, he ends up with uh, six wives in all. And again, I'm not going to go into too much detail there. But by 1543, he has now um, three children, uh, two daughters and a son. And so with his decision, as he's nearing the end of his life, to have the act of succession uh, promulgated in 1543, he's going to make sure that Mary and Elizabeth, uh, so Mary is the daughter of Catherine of Aragon, Elizabeth is the daughter of Anne Boleyn, his second wife, uh, that they return to the line of succession behind their half-brother, Edward VI. Uh, and so he wanted to make sure that his daughters could inherit the throne in case something happened to his son, Edward VI, in which he placed such great promise for. So this means that England is set up then to become the first European state after uh, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden to have a queen regnant. So a queen regnant is a woman who is ruling as a queen in her own right, not simply because she's taking over for her dead husband or uh, inheriting uh, through another family line, but simply because now she is ruling in her own name. And so this is only the second time this has happened in um, recent European history. Uh, the first being Margaret I, 
who ruled over a united Scandinavian um, uh, entity called the Kalmar Union, which included Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. Which, by the way, is an upcoming uh, lecture topic uh, in a couple of uh, sessions. I'm working on that one as we speak. So this is clearly a, a portent of change here that we see uh, a European state allowing women uh, to rule in their own name. Some countries like France have laws or written laws, asylic laws, that forbid a woman from ever becoming a monarch, and others do not. All right, so that's a little bit of background about what was going on in Reformation England with Henry VIII and his disputes with the church and how that will play into her, uh, the situation she's uh, thrust into as she becomes queen. But let's take a little break from the history to talk a little bit about how Elizabeth has been portrayed in film. She has been a popular topic, and she's been uh, in a uh, subject of many films, including the classical age. So in 1937, you had Vivian Lee. Uh, star as uh, Elizabeth in Fire Over England. Given the date of its release in 1937, obviously with the tensions in Europe building up to the Second World War, the idea of Britain being invaded by sea uh, as uh, Queen Elizabeth faced with the Spanish Armada was a very timely topic to, disc to show in film. Uh, but also, uh, as you know, uh, in many ways, Elizabeth's personal life and her relationships and the fact that she never married has always been a huge focus of popular attention. And so in some ways, this detracts from our attention on the things she actually did as a ruler when we focus on her personal life. And in some ways, she falls into the same trap as Cleopatra did, right, where you have a female ruler who is remembered mostly for her affairs rather than for her actions as a ruler. And so here we see an example of this with Betty Davis playing uh, Queen Elizabeth in The Private Lives of Elizabeth and S. Essex, which is focusing on that important relationship in her life um, between um, a, a young man, a, uh, a, a confidant, and a suitor, uh, and Elizabeth. But again, focusing on that personal aspect of her relationships. Then in 1940, you have an interesting movie about uh, Das Herz der Königin, which was a German movie which was kind of an anti-English film magnifying uh, the story of Mary, Queen of Scots. Right? And so the Germans were using Elizabeth or a negative portrayal of Elizabeth to foster this idea that Scotland should uh, you know, break away from England. That would have an impact perhaps on the Second World War. So that film was released then. And then Betty Davis returns in The Virgin Queen in 1955 as well, as you can see there. And then there's a, a bit of time before uh, she's covered in film again. But then starting in the late 1990s, we have a whole new wave of interest in Elizabeth. And so you had Judi Dench in Shakespeare in Love, which uh, puts forth this idea of, of a relationship between Shakespeare and um, Elizabeth, which has yet to ever been uh, really been solidified by any evidence, but it's an interesting film. And then you had <laughs> Helen Mirren, very accomplished actress who's played many historical uh, figures in history. Uh, in Elizabeth I in 2005. Now the unfortunate thing about these films is though they're visually stunning, the history in them is a, a, a bit um, questionable. So you have to be careful when you watch these films that uh, things are changed, uh, events are changed, or things are created that never exist in the first place. So a good place to start if you do watch this film, uh, you can even just start at Wikipedia and look at the article there and it will list the historical inaccuracies uh, in the film. Uh, Kate Blanchett uh, takes over uh, and portrays her in her younger part of her reign in Elizabeth the Golden Age in 2007. And then one of the most recent films from last year uh, was Mary Queen <coughs> of Scots, uh, which she was portrayed by Margot Robbie. We'll talk about what's the deal with the face makeup in a little bit. There's a reason for that. But this film is particularly egregious because it has Mary Queen of Scots, who turned out to be a very important foe uh, and rival to Elizabeth, uh, having them actually meet in person. That never happened in history. So that's just one example of how historical films, to add drama or to add uh, a perspective that history can't give you, um, you know, play with the actual history to make it more, I guess, compelling. So that film um, was panned by historians. So that's one of the worst ones. Now, if I were to rec uh, recommend any uh, films to watch about here, there were these two BBC miniseries. So these are TV shows that are not trying to explain everything in, in a two-hour format. And so there's much more uh, opportunity to explore some of the deeper issues of her reign. And so Helen Mirren was returning that, uh, Elizabeth I. 
And then um, the Virgin Queen uh, is also, uh, I think, one of the better ones. So there's plenty of opportunities to get to know Elizabeth through film, but there are also a lot of books written about her, as you can imagine. Uh, probably the best uh, biography that we have still, uh, although it's getting a little dated here in 1999, is Alison Weir. And she provides a lot of insights uh, on, on the enigma that is uh, Elizabeth. Uh, David Starkey wrote this book in response to uh, the 400th anniversary of her death in 2003. They had a huge exposition at the National Maritime Museum in, in Greenwich. And so this is a, a coffee table book full of lavish illustrations, pictures of paintings and items. So if you want a visual look at uh, the life of Elizabeth, that's a great book to start with. Then we have... Um, uh, Carol Levin's book, which looks at uh, kind of raising some of the issues I will raise and how Elizabeth's reign has been interpreted through the lens of both um, Elizabethan sexuality, sexual uh, gender constructs, uh, and the ways in which her, her um, femininity and the cult of virginity that she actually stoked herself uh, uh, enabled her to transgress some of those restrictive female uh, expectations of the Elizabethan era. And the most recent biography uh, is Elizabeth I by Michael Simmons. And the nice thing about him, although he's not really a professional historian, is that he's also written books on Queen Victoria, Catherine the Great, Marie Antoinette, Marie Antoinette and Mary Queen of Scots. So um, good place for you to look at uh, for other famous historical women. And we get an interesting um, look at someone who's covered these different women at the same, you know, in different times in their career. So there's some of the books and films that uh, I recommend if you're interested to learn more about Elizabeth. Okay, so we're going to move on now and talk about her early life. So she is born in 1533 to King Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, Anne Boleyn being his second of his six wives. And um, Anne Boleyn was uh, very... Uh, dutiful as a wife uh, and was hoping that this was going to be a great match for her and for Henry, um, but she had uh, an issue in which she wasn't able to produce a male heir. And as I mentioned, King Henry VIII was very uh, nervous about this given the fact that England had had a civil war over dynastic ties uh, and the right of succession uh, in which the Tudors had come to power just barely. So it was very important to him to have a male heir to secure the line. And the fact that she could not produce a male heir uh, troubled him, and so basically on trumped up charges of adultery, which were not really true, uh, she is arrested and later actually um, executed and beheaded. And so uh, the irony, of course, is that there is one of his six wives, Henry VIII's wives, who did cheat on him, uh, Catherine Howard, uh, and she did um, also get executed for that. Uh, but again, she's 16, you know, between 16 and 17 years old, so um, the expectations of um, that fell on these women who became uh, queens is uh, pretty interesting in, in a 21st century context. So she grew up uh, with, with her knowing that her mother had been executed for treason. And so that had a huge impact on her life. Uh, some historians have postulized that in some ways it traumatized her. And so she grew up having that stain and that, that shadow uh, all throughout her life might account for why, she, one of the many reasons why she decides never to marry. Right? But uh, she was doted on as a child and given the best tutors England had to offer and so she became very, very educated for her day and became a polygot. She was fluent in French, Italian, and Latin and she could speak passable Spanish, Welsh, Irish, Flemish, Greek, and even Cornish. One of those dialects uh, in the south uh, west of England is now pretty sort of extinct but it's making a comeback. One of the interesting things about her is that she was quite vulgar, right? So she's very uh, smart uh, and very refined and has great taste and is appreciative of artwork, uh, but she's vulgar. So she could get into these uh, discussions and she would speak her mind uh, as a man and not pull any punches. She also rode a horse and would ride a horse um, uh, as a man would, not uh, sitting sideways uh, as the custom or sitting or riding in a carriage. So again, reinforcing her ways of, of trying to transgress those sexual norms and gender norms of her age. And because of her education, she was actually also a very accomplished poet uh, and an author. And you can actually buy on Amazon uh, a book written by her uh, called Elizabeth First Collected Works. 
So you can read her poems, her, uh, her treatises, uh, and it's a really fascinating read. She is what, uh, this is a new term to me, I learned very recently. She was what was we call a clothes horse, someone who has a huge clothing collection. She was very much uh, very aware of her public persona and that her attire and her appearance uh, would engender that public persona uh, and give her support from her subjects. And so she had a huge clothing collection and she's estimated to have over 2,000 pairs of gloves in her collection, just to give you an idea. Uh, and she was very passionate about the latest styles. So she, a lot of these paintings you see of her are wearing very um, interesting uh, co you know, uh, dresses and, and costumes. Uh, she really did uh, embrace some of the cutting edge of fashion of her day. Now, the reason why she's often portrayed with uh, the white makeup is because her face was uh, scarred to a great extent by small, she suffered about a smallpox in 1562. She had facial scarring, and she actually lost a bit of her hair as well. And those uh, scars and hair loss uh, contributed to her wanting to portray or wear this makeup to cover up that fact. So that's why she is, although this is probably a, a bit extreme here, but she did wear wigs, right? She did wear wigs also to cover up her hair loss and the ravages of smallpox. And so that painting there, uh, her below, so that's her parents uh, up top there, Henry and Anne Boleyn, and then that's uh, Elizabeth, age 13. So as she's growing up as a teenager, her half-siblings are the ones who inherit the throne. So when King Henry VIII dies in 1547, it's her half-brother, Edward VI, who's going to uh, inherit the throne. And he's a very young boy at the time. He's crowned at the age of nine. And so there's a Regency Council uh, created to rule England, obviously until he would reach maturity. And Edward, by the way, was the son of Jane Seymour, his third, Henry VIII's third wife, and probably his most beloved. Uh, she died uh, as a result of childbirth. And so um, if she had survived, it's, it's probable that um, he would have been happy with Jane Seymour and not had sought to have three more wives. <laughs> um, and so Edward VI, however, even though uh, as a young boy, had been very much uh, affected by the ideas of the Protestant Reformation and the counselors and the Regency uh, counselors who were helping him rule England were also in that camp. And so we see a very firm movement towards Protestantism and the Reformation uh, under his rule, which led to several revolts by uh, English Catholics, including one in 1549. But by then, uh, he's already very sickly. He was a sickly child to begin with, uh, and he dies at the age of 15 from tuberculosis. And that's going to create another succession crisis. And so um, uh, what they're going to do is pass over the claims of his half-sister, Mary, and, and these counselors are going to try to put the crown on a young Protestant uh, distant relative, Lady Jane Grey, who was 16 years old. Uh, but that... Uh, plot to get her on throne on the throne, Lady Jane Grey is very quickly uh, put down, and she herself is also executed in favor of returning to Henry VIII's oldest daughter, uh, Mary I, who was born of Catherine of Aragon. This, of course, is going to entail a huge change because Mary, Elizabeth's sister, is a staunch Catholic. So, where we had seen England embracing the Reformation, the creation of the Church of England under Henry VIII and then uh, really embracing the Reformation, uh, the Radical Reformation under Edward VI, now Mary, who, by the way, is going to rule as the first queen regnant of England. So the very first woman uh, to rule in England is Mary. And right? of course, she's remembered mainly as Bloody Mary. Uh, but let's not forget that she was actually the first woman to rule England in her own name. And so she, in some ways, paved the path for her sister, Elizabeth, uh, to take the throne. So uh, she marries um, another Spaniard, or she, as her father had done. Catherine of Aragon was from Spain. She marries uh, Philip II. This was a very unpopular move because Philip II was the most powerful Catholic monarch in Europe, uh, one of the most powerful uh, empires in the world at the time. And so this pretty much signaled that uh, the Reformation was going to be stopped. Uh, and in fact, that it was going to revert to Catholicism. And so Mary pursued a very vigorous policy of returning Catholicism to England, including executing many prominent uh, 
reformers uh, and theologians. And so there were over 300 uh, Protestant martyrs who were uh, executed by Mary during her reign. Now, Elizabeth, as a Protestant, right, although not a very vocal or staunch Protestant, was seen with suspicion by her half-sister Mary, and she was basically kept under house arrest for much of this period. At one point in 1554, when there was a rebellion against Mary, she was tried in prison on uh, suspicion of abetting this rebellion called the Wyatt's Rebellion, and she narrowly escapes her mother's fate. There were some of Mary's uh, counselors who urged her to execute Elizabeth, to, to have her sister executed. Uh, and so the fact that she consciously kept a very low profile uh, was one of the ways in which she was able to save herself from this um, very volatile situation. And she was a master of public relations, and she, again, understood this need to have a public persona, but at this point in her life, she knows that as someone who is seen as a threat to Mary's rule and stability, that she needs to have a very low profile. And so uh, she avoids uh, you know, attracting attention in ways that could get her involved in these plots and, and get her uh, executed. Mary herself has the same problem as her father does, and that is trying to produce a male heir. Uh, she had several what they were calling hysterical pregnancies where she thought she had uh, was pregnant but was not. But uh, later we realized that, uh, historians have realized that she had actually uterine cancer. And so that was part of, part of the reason why she had these uh, hysterical pregnancies. And she dies from cancer at age 42 in November of 1558. Now to give you an idea of uh, the status of the relationship between Philip II and Mary, uh, he wasn't even in the country at the time when she died. And he said uh, famously, I felt a reasonable regret for her death. So not a very uh, close uh, relationship there. And again, another reminder to Elizabeth about what happens when you marry a man as, um, as a ruler. So now that Mary has died, that leaves her the last of the children of Henry VIII. And so she becomes queen as right of succession on the 15th of January, 1559, at the age of 25. So she's the third child of Henry VIII to assume the throne. And unlike her half-sister and half-brother, she's going to rule for almost uh, over 40 years. And so she will lend her name to an entire age. And throughout almost the entirety of that process, she has her right-hand man, who is very much responsible for her policies or helping to craft her policies and her even uh, stance on many of the important critical issues of the day, and that was Sir William Cecil. And so he was her chief secretary, and he basically was a very politically cautious, uh, conservative individual who of often sought to create compromises then rather than radical reform. And so that steadying hand, plus her own inclinations uh, to, be, uh, to work towards compromise, will have very important results in ways of eventually solving or helping to um, move forward the dispute between Protestant Catholics in uh, the English Kingdom. And so that relationship between Elizabeth and Sir William Cecil will last for four decades. He is influential, very uh, in uh, instrumental in helping discover several assassination plots. So throughout her reign, she is beset by both foreign intrigues and domestic intrigues, people who wanted to have her uh, removed from power or assassinated. And so she was always under threat. And remember, her mother was executed for treason as well. So I think all those things, that psychological impact, must have had a huge, you know, somewhat of an impact on who she was and how she ruled. Uh, Sir William Cecil's main goal uh, was to create a united British Isles with a strong navy. And by the time of the end of the Elizabethan era, that has pretty much become um, an accepted fact. So in reality, he does a lot to help Elizabeth establish that goal. <coughs> So the first issue she had to deal with, a difficult one, was the religious settlement. Right? So you just went from having Edward VI, which was, who was hoping for a more radical re reformation, and then you had Mary, who had reverted everything and wanted to bring everything back to Catholicism. And so Elizabeth's solution is to, if you can guess, go somewhere in between. And that's pretty much what she does. So with this act of uniformity, what she does is allow for Protestantism to become, uh, take hold in England, but not radical ver versions of uh, Protestantism. And so we see a compromise on theology. And so the Anglican Church uses a modified 1552 book of common prayer. 
and she does not force uh, outward obedience. In other words, if you were a Catholic, an English Catholic, uh, you didn't have to be forced to convert, uh, but um, there were some restrictions that were placed on you, uh, particularly serving in public life. But she didn't force consciousness. So she didn't force you to convert one way or the other. But she also felt pressure from the Protestants as well. So she was being pressured by Catholics who wanted to return England to Catholicism. And then she was pr pressured by radical Protestants who wanted to make England an even more, uh, uh, have that Reformation take hold. And so she uh, pushes back against people like the Puritans who wanted to have much more extensive radical reform. It's always interesting that so many Americans think that the Puritans left England because of religious discrimination. When in reality, they wanted to create a more restrictive version of Protestantism in England, and when they were stymied in that goal, some of them went to the Netherlands, and then later they went to New England to create a more stringent version of uh, Protestantism, which included, by the way, outlawing Christmas. Christmas was outlawed in the Massachusetts colony up until, I believe, the 1690, early 1690s, if I recall. So those Puritans, again, they were dis disaffected because they wanted more reform, and Elizabeth denied them that opportunity. Now, when Philip II uh, de declares, the, the King of Spain declares war in England with the intent to return Catholicism to England, then more restrictions were imposed on English Catholics. And by the way, the, the full uh, emancipation of English Catholics did not, uh, 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 did not occur until 1829 with the Roman Catholic Relief Act of 1829. So the thorny issue between uh, Protestants and Catholics, the long history of the British Isles and Ireland uh, moves along, although Elizabeth, as I mentioned, really was hoping to find some kind of compromise position. She was not a religious zealot, uh, and so she wanted there to be, this was not one of the issues she really wanted to focus on. So another big issue, of course, about Elizabeth's reign and who she was is, of course, the fact that she defied everyone, including the entire nation, in remaining single. Right? It was an expectation that as a ruler, you would get married. Not only does that help solidify the line of succession, but it also, when you marry, that entails some kind of political benefit that you can bring two factions together or two countries together. And she wasn't going to have any of it. And so she famously said, I would rather be a beggar and single than a queen and married. And so what she learned was that she could use courtships or potential marriages as a very interesting vehicle to get her foreign policy objectives completed. And so using these courtships was a big important element of her foreign policy. She also had to be very careful about uh, any uh, marriage potentialities because uh, of the fear that of succession, right? That if something happened to her or then uh, Mary Queen of Scots, her cousin up in Scotland could return to the line and then she would of course revert England back to Catholicism. So many of her counselors were very much uh, after Elizabeth to secure a line of succession, to get married and to prevent a situation where Mary Queen of Scots or the Catholics could uh, reassume power and, and undo the Reformation. But Throughout her reign, she decides not to uh, fall into that trap. And so, like as my point there says, she defies the entire nation, her counselors uh, and everyone around her. And so in that way, she was very, very remarkable. You can see again in these paintings why, first of all, that she's a clothes horse wearing these very exotic um, uh, clothes uh, and that she wanted these paintings to be a way to project her image, her image of power and later her uh, image as a virgin. So she cultivates this uh, cult of the Virgin Queen as a way, as a kind of a PR move to get the English people to accept the fact that she is in fact not going to marry and not have any children. And so eventually the English people could become accustomed to this and uh, uh, there's lots of uh, popular imagery, poetry, art uh, that reflects this cult of the Virgin Queen. So she's very successful in that regard, to turn the conversations from her not getting married into something else that actually helps her and helps solidify her power base. So again, very shrewd, very uh, uh, talented politician to be able to pull that off, especially in the early modern period. So who were some of her suitors, right? And she had a whole host of them. Right? And so a lot of the movies focus on these um, relationships. 
So it is true that she had a very long uh, unrequited love that in some ways really soured her on this whole process. So as children, as a child, she played with and was uh, known Robert Dudley for m most of her life, uh, and they were very close. They had a friendship that lasted uh, for decades, uh, for over 30 years, but he was uh, not anyone really important. He was nobody of, of means. Marrying him would not bring any gain to uh, her throne. And so it was politically uh, not expedient for them to get married. And so she resented that. And so she was uh, very sad when Robert Dudley got married uh, and was kind of passive aggressive about it. And then, of course, there's a lot of rumors and stories about what happened to Robert Dudley's wife. Again, the films kind of, uh, some of the films gloss over this subject. Uh, give you, to give you a little quick s recap, his wife, uh, Robert Dudley's wife, uh, has some strange illnesses and then finally she falls down the stairs and, is, and dies as a result of that accident. Mm -hmm. And that seemed as if that was the moment where they can now finally consummate their, their love and get married. But again, for political reasons, she wasn't able to do so. And so that was a big um, disappointment for both of them. And eventually Robert Dudley remarries another woman and Elizabeth gets upset about that. So the undercurrent in all of her life of revolving marriage is the fact that the, one, the man she really wanted to marry, she never could. So now enter a whole host of different uh, monarchs, different rulers from different parts of Europe, all vying to become Elizabeth's husband. So Philip II, the man who had married his, her half-sister, Mary, uh, made the same offer, right? But of course, that would bring England back into an alliance with the most powerful Catholic state in Europe. And so uh, this was obviously not, would not be as popular for her as it was for Mary. And so she turned that offer down. And Philip will later become, of course, very upset when Mary Queen of Scots is executed and then have the Spanish Armada a result of it. So what Elizabeth thought she could do with these marriage prospects was to jockey the two big ruling families of Europe. So in Europe, we have the Habsburgs, who control Austria and Spain, and the Valois, who control France. And so they were at war with each other, the French and the Habsburgs. So if she married one of these uh, rulers, uh, she would kind of be throwing her lot into those struggles. And so she was trying to extract concessions and benefits from these potential marriages, and she allowed these, um, uh, this, this suitor process to take place over uh, several years, but ultimately nothing ever comes of it. So first she has an offer from the Archduke of Austria to get married, 1563 to 67. Uh, that doesn't pan out. Then, later on, when she's a little bit older, when she's in her 40s, uh, one of the French princes comes up uh, with this courtship plan with Francis I. And he was quite young. He was 24 and she was 46. But again, it would be the same problem. If she closely lies with the Valois and the French, then they would have to fight the Habsburgs. So by avoiding these marriages, she's avoiding entanglements that could put England into conflicts in which England would not have much benefit. Um, a little side story about um, uh, Francis here. I don't know if you can see it so much on his um, photo there, uh, the painting there, uh, but Elizabeth famously called Francis her frog and finding him not so deformed as she'd been led to expect. So he had, you know, he was not an attractive man and so she called him her frog, right? Uh, so that gives you an idea of how these men were at really, you know, at the whims of her desires and uh, ambitions for what she thought was best for England. Another suitor was Eric uh, the Ninth of, uh, of, of, I'm sorry, the 14th of Sweden, uh, but he had his own problems. He had bouts of insanities and was later dethroned and murdered. <coughs> now her counselors eventually decided that these foreign entanglements weren't the best, but the best possible way for her to get married would be to create a, a situation in which Scotland and England would be united by that marriage, and therefore the children of that marriage would become rulers of a united Great Britain. Uh, that didn't happen, but her next successor, James I, was King of Scotland and becomes King of England at the same time, and so that process of creating Great Britain, or the union between England and Scotland, begins with her next successor. So even though, uh, in the end, she doesn't have any marriages, uh, she's able to charter course in which England becomes a great power and eventually completes that goal of unifying the British Isles under one monarchy. 
So that's pretty impressive feat to do all those things without actually having gotten getting married herself. And by the way, this cult of uh, the Virgin Queen is, of course, why the name Virginia was given to the first child born of English colonists at the Roanoke Lost Colony, which disappeared. And of course, why Virginia was named Virginia. So at all points of her reign, she was beset by foreign and domestic forces, which led to some of her you know, very cautious uh, decisions and policies. So there was a, an, uh, a plot against her in 1569, uh, the, the uh, Northern Earls Rebellion. And these were Catholic nobles in Northern England who were involved uh, in this plot. Uh, it was eventually put down after s small sk skirmishes. Then two years later, you had the Ridolfi assassination plot. So the Northern Earls Rebellion was a rebellion to overthrow her as a ruler. The Ridolfi was, plot was actually to assassinate her. Right? Not just to remove her from power, but specifically just to assassinate her. And it was led by a man named Rudolfi, who was a Florentine banker. But Sir Robert Cecil, Cecil's uh, intelligence network and his spies discovered the plot. Uh, he fled and it, nothing came of it. But the most dangerous of all these plots was the Throckmorton plot of 1583. And in this one, the English Catholics had actually plotted an invasion of England which involved the French. Uh, and that they would place Mary, Queen of Scots, on the throne um, uh, and then return England to Catholicism. So Mary, Queen of Scots, we should talk about her, and that's a painting of her up there. She was a uh, granddaughter of Henry VIII's sister. So she's a cousin to Elizabeth. So uh, in theory, she could inherit the throne, although she has, doesn't have a direct claim uh, as Elizabeth does. But of course, she's Catholic. So for those who wanted to return England to Catholicism, she was a beacon of hope. And in reality, she was behind, or was a participant, whether uh, active or not, in all three of these plots. Finally, in 1586, there's another plot, the Babington plot, to try to assassinate Elizabeth and ally Scotland with France. It's kind of amazing, in retrospect, at least my perspective, that she was so restrained in dealing with uh, Mary that it's only after this fourth plot that she decides to move against her. And so eventually, uh, uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, will be executed in February of 1587. Now, Elizabeth claims that she never signed the death warrant, that the death warrant was there, it was on her desk, but that her counselors had taken it and then had signed it without her approval. Now, whether or not this was, again, her spinning this uh, event to make her look the best possible way or not uh, is still reflective of her definite uh, awareness that the public perception of this execution was, impor was important. And so even though her, her um, counselors were advising her to execute Mary, she, of course, was very reticent to do so, perhaps thinking about her mother and how she had been executed uh, for treason as well. But by uh, having this situation where she didn't actually sign a death warrant, she's not directly responsible for the execution, although it happened under her watch. So in other words, what's the term we use today? plausible deniability. So she has plausible deniability that she didn't actively sign the death order, but it was pretty obvious that this was the only way that that was going to solve this problem of these plots to overthrow her. Now the last of these rebellions had nothing to do uh, with Catholicism or with um, Queen Mary, but this is the Earl of Essex, and he kind of takes over the place of Robert Dudley, that man she'd long been friends with uh, and had been as, um, someone she wished she could have a relationship with. Although he clearly was uh, using this only for his own uh, desires and staged a rebellion in which he thought he could overthrow uh, Elizabeth and it was a farce and he, he and his supporters were captured and he's executed. But she was devastated by that betrayal right? because he was somebody who she thought was, was close to her because he felt, had feelings for her, not because he was just ambitious and trying to uh, seize the throne for himself. So that was the undercurrent of a lot of what was happening during her reign, that she was facing these assassination plots right, and uh, all these conflicts over uh, religion. So that, that has a huge impact on the international situation and her foreign policy. So we need to remember that at this point, because of the Reformation and the conflicts between Catholics and Protestants all over Europe, that much of the power politics was revolving around um, these alliances. So you had a war between Catholics and Protestants in France from 1562 
1598, the Edict of Nantes, when Protestantism was officially tolerated in France, which would be the, the, the situation for about a century. The Dutch were revolting against Spain, the Habsburgs, for 80 years, the 80-year revolt from 1568 to 1648. And then you had a minor war between uh, rival German factions, uh, again, between Protestant Catholics in 1546 and 47. So throughout this period, warfare, and this is even before the Thirty Years' War, which was one of the most destructive wars ever to hit Europe uh, in the 17th century, but that's after Elizabeth dies. So the context of much of the foreign relations between the different countries of Europe were placed in this rubric now of these two factions, Protestants and Catholics, uh, fighting over um, the course of the Reformation. So now that England is firmly Protestant, she is uh, allying herself with the Dutch, who are trying to achieve independence from Spain, and the Dutch themselves are Reformed or ca Calvinist. And so in 1585, she uh, forms an alliance with the Dutch, which also made sense since the Dutch had a large merchant navy, just as the English did. And so by helping the Dutch against Spain, of course, that aroused the, the, the anger of Spain and King Philip II. And so from that point forward, there's going to be an intermittent war with Spain between 1585 and 1604, although technically war was never officially declared between either party, interestingly enough. But Philip II, who had already married uh, his uh, Elizabeth's sister, Mary, and had tried to marry Elizabeth, now is furious that Mary, Queen of Scots, was executed. And so he is now uh, of the desire to send an arm a massive armada, one of the largest armadas up to that point in European history, to invade England, to depose Elizabeth, and reimpose Catholicism. This is the famous Spanish Armada of 1588. It was a huge fleet of 130 ships, 8,000 sailors, and 18,000 soldiers. And they sailed from Spain, and then they would pick up soldiers. The plan was that this Spanish Armada would then stop in the Low Countries, in what's today Belgium, and pick up another 30,000 troops. And from there, they would be ferried across English Channel and invade England. And that would have been a huge army. Uh, the English would never have had an army that large. So if those ships could successfully ferry those troops over, uh, it would probably be, uh, be a done deal and that England would be overthrown and that they could return England to Catholicism. So the way for England to survive and for Elizabeth's reign to survive would be to stop the Spanish fleet before they could land those troops on the shore. So the hope was that there would be a decisive naval action or naval battle which could prevent the Spanish from invading Britain. Of course, Britain as a, England as an, as an island nation, of course, was always very much aware of the need to have a strong navy. Henry VIII, her father, had been building up the English navy, but it was still in its kind of infancy. And so um, she had to rely on privateers or private ships uh, that were owned by private citizens that were hired out to the state. But between the privateers and that small English navy, they're able to defeat the Spanish <coughs> Armada at Gravelines, and then the storms of the North Atlantic did the rest. And so whatever ships weren't defeated by the, the English in that battle, most of them are, are lost uh, as they tried to sail around the British Isles and return to Spain. So in the context of this long, very long war with Spain, it wasn't decisive because <coughs> the, the following year, the English suffered a pretty grave defeat when they tried to invade Spain. But it had a significant propaganda and morale boost uh, that ty typifies her ability to use these events as a way to solidify her rule and increase her popularity. So most of the films that cover Elizabeth I always have this scene. It's a very uh, rousing speech she gave. And this is only just a small <coughs> part of it, but I'll read it to you. So she said this just before the fleet was leaving uh, for this fateful battle to see whether or not the Spanish Armada would be defeated. She said famously, I know I have the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king, and a king of England too, and think foul scorn that any prince of Europe should dare to invade the borders of my realm. I myself will be your general, judge, and rewarder of every one of your virtues in the field. And so she dispelled any uh, worries that she couldn't, wouldn't be up to the task because she was a woman. Uh, she was there to rally the troops. Uh, and, of course, that victory in 1588 was a big propaganda victory. So one of the biggest aspects of her legacy is the role she plays in helping to build up the Navy. And it's the English, and this is where I'm getting into my topic because uh, my dissertation was on 17th century privateering. So bear with me here. 
Uh, so uh, what happens is that the British Navy starts from moving to, from being a semi-private, semi-public um, feature, in which you'd have state ships owned by the state and then private ships, these privateers owned by private citizens, more towards a fully-fledged national navy. These English ships were also fighting in different ways. They were emphasizing speed, mobility, and long-range gunnery, that you would build these cannons to a specific uh, size, that all the cannons on a ship would be of the same size rather than haphazard. Uh, uh, and by fighting from range, that meant that those slow Spanish ships, those huge galleons, uh, couldn't defend themselves as these smaller English ships would dart around them and shoot them from afar. So the idea of getting into close combat in boarding ships, which had been a part of naval warfare for thousands of years, is now moving towards what we have today, which is, of course, uh, few Navy sailors expect to board a ship in combat, right? You're having combat from now miles away. Having fully rigged ships, more maneuverable ships, uh, some of the best uh, shipbuilding techniques were developed under her reign. Uh, and that's not all. She also, uh, with her counselors, created an entire bureaucracy to manage the Navy. And so having a naval administration, the admiralty itself, that you have mustering of sailors, victualling or supplying of the ships and the sailors, maintenance of the ships and repair, all those things were brought under the purview of the admiralty. And so that kind of state bureaucracy building is another thing that historians of the early modern period find very remarkable. So the way in which the modern state controls the military, we see early aspects of this uh, with Elizabeth Serene. Because she was always starved for cash, she did have to use privateers. Now, often privateers are associated as being synonymous with pirates. Now, the big difference between a privateer and a pirate is a privateer has a letter of mark, which is a contract that says, I'm going to behave in a certain way and only capture ships of uh, people who are at war with England. So I can't capture anyone who I want, right? I can only capture enemies of the state. And so this is what we call commerce warfare. So rather than attacking any ship that passes by, what we, uh, is only attacking ships involved in commerce for Spain. And so the logical outgrowth of that is what happens in the 20th century with U-boat uh, submarine campaigns, right? Those campaigns of the submarines were to sink the commerce, right? To stop the commerce. So this idea of attacking a nation by attacking its commerce or trade, again, is a very modern thinking way of looking at international diplomacy and conflicts. Famously, uh, she authorizes Sir Francis Drake to circ circumnavigate the world, which he does in 1577 to 1580, so the first English men to sail around the world. So if you're a fan of English naval history, Elizabeth looms very large in this process. <coughs> Her counselors help create the process by which the English Navy will become the dominant naval power of Europe. And it's the fact that the English are the naval, dominant naval power of Europe that allows them to monopolize the Atlantic world as Europeans colonize the Americas. And it's from those, uh, the domination of the Atlantic world and the sugared slaves that give the English the capital necessary to have the Industrial Revolution first. So if you can think about it, she sets in part um, in, uh, in motion the forces that will make Britain, uh, England, uh, not only a, a top-rate European power, but a world power, and eventually have an empire that spans the entire globe. By the way, the most newest British aircraft carrier built uh, this here is named for Queen Elizabeth. Not Queen Elizabeth II, who's reigning now, but for her in recognition of her role in the English Navy. Okay, I am out, I'm running out of time here. I've got five minutes, so how do I sum this all up? Right? So she dies uh, at the age of 69 in 1603. Uh, she was known, she was beloved by her subjects, so it was a profound sense of loss. And she was known as Good Queen Bess. And uh, despite that, though, uh, she had detractors, particularly in continental Europe. And so there were many smear campaigns, those that saw her as a nymphomaniac or trying to explain why she never got married that she was barren, or that she was half man or half woman, or secretly a man, right? So a lot of negative portrayals of her. Um, or rumors are being or her being tied to Shakespeare, an example. Uh, but those were typical, as we see, for these women in power, that uh, when they die or when they step down, that their detractors come out with, of the woodwork, often tied to issues involving their sexuality and their gender. So that shouldn't surprise us. But in reality, what we have is an enduring legacy of an accomplished woman in power. And 
So these are just some of the things that she leaves her mark on that have a huge impact on not only English history, but world history. So first off, she's the last of the Tudors, right? So she's the last of that dynasty. Uh, and she's the last English monarch to reign unmarried. So ever since then, every English monarch has been married. She was also the last to rule over England before its union with Scotland. And maybe in a couple months, I might have to change the slide. Because <laughs> as you know, with Brexit, uh, Scotland voted, the Scottish voted overwhelmingly against uh, uh, the, the election of the Conservatives. And so Scotland's already talking about another uh, nationality referendum. The endure, enduring religious settlement, the compromise, right, to make a kind of uh, more uh, watered down version of radical Protestantism or Protestantism in England rather than or the radical version, uh, and to not force conscience, right, although there were some restrictions on Catholics, so that was kind of a compromise. She even enacted laws thinking ahead towards things like what we have today with Social Security and unemployment insurance, ways to help alleviate the positions of the poor uh, with the poor law in 1601. I just mentioned how important she was in the context of the growth and supremacy of the English Navy. And through her cautious policies, she really established England as not a third-rate backward regional power, but a leading power player in all the politics of Europe on its way to becoming uh, a world empire. And she's really the first English monarch to truly recognize how important it is to rule by popular consent. That it's not just about what she wants, it's what the people of England or the British Isles want, and that her policy should reflect those popular opinions. So when we think about politicians and their desire to respond to popular opinion, she was very early on aware of that need and importance of that in the context of how she ruled and her, again, one of the many aspects of how she was quite a remarkable ruler. Um, and she, again, she's a very uh, enduring legacy of an accomplished woman in power. And with that, I would be very happy to entertain any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. So early on, I, I think you said that basically at least two of Henry's wives were uh, lost their jobs, as it were, yeah. because they were unable to produce a male heir. Right. On what basis did they decide to stop waiting? How, I mean... In other words, what was their, what was their parameters for waiting until... And they didn't have the <coughs> medical science to know. Oh. And, um, they, and even now, we can't know that the right. person is capable of being that's, giving birth to a certain gender. That's a really interesting question. So, uh, I, I think, did they have like two years, three years? Or what there's no set pattern to how he reacts. So he was with Catherine of Aragon for much longer than he was with... Um, I, think, I think what happens is as Henry gets older, the need to have that male heir gets more pre pre prescient. So he, as he gets older, he has less patience for these delays. So early on, uh, he was with Catherine of Aragon for, you know, some, for some time. Uh, but yeah, he's getting very much worried about that, that specific. And so Anne Boleyn did have children, but she had girls. And so um, that's why. Uh, so um, the third wife, uh, uh, Jane Seymour, she gave him a son. So he thought the problem was solved, but she died in childbirth. Then his next wife, um, uh, it was the one that cheated on him, you know, Catherine Howard, uh, he executes her. Uh, and then um, by then he's no longer having children. So, but yeah, it's an interesting question. I think as, as my, 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 the way I would answer that would be, I guess, as he got older, the need to have that heir became more important. Yeah. When did medicine advance to the point where they realized the male determines the sex of the offspring? Yeah, they didn't, they, they didn't know, <laughs> as far as I know. No, I know yeah. not then. Yeah. It's one between the one. Oh, well, I, Was it the only way to get um, Anne Boleyn was to behead her? He couldn't, like, why did he have to kill her? Because, uh, it, because it's a really convoluted story, and I'd have to refresh myself up. So, um, yeah, yeah, I, that's, I, I, she was accused of lots of things, right? And it, most of it was charges that were trying to get it to stick to get her to be uh, accused of treason. Uh, I think what's clear, I think the consensus is that she was innocent of all the charges, but it didn't matter. He wanted her out of the way, uh, and he couldn't annul the marriage in the way he did with, with Catherine, and so... How come? Why couldn't he? Um, 
I think I think he saw that because she was first of all not you know part of a royal family from another country that he would probably be able to get rid of her much quicker and easier than he did with Catherine of Aragon. So was I'm not Catholic. Was she Catholic? No, no, she was Protestant. So he could have gotten a divorce. I guess he could have. Right. Yes. I'm not a I'm not a specialist on Henry VIII, but uh, specifics of that. Uh, but uh, it was a trumped up charge. I know that. And I, he chunked it up or his? Or? Probably a combination of, uh, or you know, his counselors came up with the scheme and he agreed to it. Because it just seems cool because it seemed like they were loving each other. At first, yes, I think they were. But then he had somebody in the, he had somebody in the wings. <laughs> so it's interesting to me that Elizabeth, in her youth, probably never imagined that she would become queen because there were so many. Right. Things. Yeah, I, that was, uh, and that was part of, part of the reason why she, I think she was so cautious and kept a low profile, was she wasn't expecting to be thrust. You know, her, her sister Mary could have ruled for decades for all, we, you know, all she knew, um, or, or her brother for that matter. Uh, uh, Edward the uh, Edward the Sixth. Is, is, is that is that the Edward who's in the, the Mark Twain novel, The Prince and the Pauper? Uh, I don't think I. I'm trying to think. I didn't read that back in high school. Yeah, I don't remember. Because he's a boy, so I think that would be. It could be. Does anyone know? I don't know. But no, that's that's you know. He represents a lot of what ifs. Edward, definitely. What if? Because if, if he had lived, the Protestantism in England probably would have been much more uh, radical or stricter than the one that emerged. Um, Puritans would have come to him. Yeah, that, that, that might have been the case. How did Mary, Bloody Mary die? Cancer. I know you said it, but it's a lot of information. They didn't call it cancer then. No, they didn't know, yeah. Who rules after Elizabeth? Uh, so after Elizabeth is James I, so now we have a new dynasty, so the Tudors end, and you have the Stuart uh, monarch, Stu Tudor dynasty, Stuarts, and they are from Scotland. So that's what brings Scotland and England together, first by marriage, and then in 1707, it's, the union is uh, made official. So Great Britain exists in 1707. The union of the, the English monarchy is, is 1603. Um, and now, like I said, with Brexit, we'll see what happens. Okay. Thank you so much, folks. Have a great holiday. Look forward to seeing you guys again soon.